I want to speak to you today about, oh, I'm going to need some glasses. It seems my arm gets a little longer every year. I'd like to speak about a subject that I've been reflecting on for the last several years, actually. To me, it has always been a lacuna, a empty lack, lacking part of uh, the free grace discussion. Uh, and that is a subject of what it means to enter the kingdom. I'd like to start out with a story. I, I can't remember if I've shared this before, but if I had, forget it. Most of you probably have not heard this. A story about a farmer by the name of Bill Miller. He uh, <coughs> reflected the values so commonly associated with Farmers in the Midwest, his friends would refer to him as hardworking, a family man, devoted, uh, terms which endeared him to those around him. And one day, while plowing the fields, this 72-year-old man of character had a heart attack, and he bought the farm. Now, I realize that Michael Eaton is here, and he's unfamiliar with English. I, uh, I understand his problem because I'm going to England in uh, a couple of weeks, and I have problems understanding English as well. So, so just for Michael's benefit, I want to explain what bought the farm means. It's an expression we use here for when a person, a farmer, dies, his life insurance pays off the mortgage. So they say when a farmer dies, he bought the farm. Well, as the story goes, Bill ascended to the gates of heaven, and he was met there by St. Peter. And as he stood before this awesome entryway, Bill looked at this massive oak arch sign above these oak doors, which read 1,000 points. Now, by now, you know this is a phony story. Bill greeted, or Peter greeted Bill saying, Welcome, Bill. I'm here to evaluate your life and determine whether or not you should be permitted to enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's get started. Bill said, St. Peter, what have you done? Why should you be permitted to enter? Well, Bill replied, I've been a loving husband for over 50 years. I've served my wife and I've been faithfully devoted to her. Peter was quite impressed. He said, wonderful. That'll be one point. <laughs> Looking at the 1,000 point sign over the door, Bill said, one point? Is that all I get? Well, Peter was quite pleased. And he marked down on his score pad, on a yellow pad that he brought with him, one point. What else, Bill? Well, Bill thought for a moment. He said, well, I've raised four wonderful children. They all believe in God. <clears throat> They're serving him in their communities, and they have reputations as men and women of character. Very impressive, exclaimed Peter. That's outstanding. Rarely have I seen a man of such character who has appeared before me. That'll be one point. And he made another mark on his yellow pad. Now realizing that his entire life had only amounted to two points, as he looked at the 1,000 point goal, Bill confidently announced what he thought would surely cause the gates to swing wide open. He said, well, I've been faithful in church attendance and I've believed in God. What's more, I've been heavily involved in the work of my church and I've given substantially of my material goods. Well, Peter gazed at this God-fearing man and Bill could tell he'd made an impact. Peter said, rarely have I seen such an incredible demonstration of doing good, loving others, and serving one's family, as I've seen in you. Well done, Bill. That'll be one point. Well, looking again at the thousand-point marker over the entryway and realizing that his whole life had only amounted to three points, 
Bill threw up his hands and said, well, I guess it's only by the grace of God that I'll get in here. And Peter said, that'll be 997 points. Come on in. Well, this story, of course, emerges from the lore of folk theology, but it raises some questions that I want to address this morning. What is the kingdom of heaven? Does it refer to heaven when you die, uh, as the story assumes? Why is this kingdom presented in the Gospels as something we can enter and experience now, and not just after we have bought the farm? And if interest into heaven is based on grace alone, why did Jesus say that only those who do the will of the Father will enter? Why did he say that in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must have a righteousness, a ethical behavior, a lifestyle that is far superior to that of the scribes and the Pharisees? It would appear that based upon these statements, that Jesus made, and a number of others, which we're going to look at, there's a tension set up. There seems to be a difference between the faith alone gospel that Jesus presented in the Gospel of John and that you see in Paul throughout the epistles, and some of the passages primarily in the synoptics, which indicate that entering entering the kingdom of heaven is based on works. Now, In the New Testament, there are some 23 entry sayings, as they're commonly called in the commentaries. Uh, The first category of those sayings that talk about entering the kingdom. For example, John 3, verse 5, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Or when Jesus addressed the rich young ruler, In speaking to his disciples afterwards, he said how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Also, the phrases entering into life come into view. Uh, Matthew 18, verses 8 and 9, for example. It's better to enter into life maimed than uh, having, uh, you know, both your eyes and hands and whatnot, Uh, to go into Gehenna, which some understand to be eternal damnation. I don't, personally. Another category are the references to seeking. One of the more perplexing passages that we run across, for example, is in Romans 2.7. For those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor the outcome is eternal life. So it looks as if seeking by works secures one eternal life. And then finally, there are the references to seeking the kingdom, like in Matthew uh, 6.33. Seek his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And a passage that we're going to be looking at quite a bit over the next two hours. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom. Now notice this individual is in the kingdom, but he's not only disobeyed the least of these commandments, but he's actively taught others to do the same. He's told people to do things that God didn't say, You might call him a false prophet. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And there we have our phrase again, enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, all of this, of course, raises the question, are works, as some of these passages seem to say, a condition for entering the kingdom? As I just quoted, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom. Later in Matthew 7, Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate, 
For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Now, I know that it's a popular free grace uh, interpretation to understand the will of the Father as believing in Christ. That is certainly plausible. However, in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, the will of the Father is what he's been talking about the preceding uh, two and a half chapters. It's living out the lifestyle, the ethical principles, demonstrating the character qualities defined in the, king, in the sermon. Now here's one. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better you t- for you to enter life, again, one of those entry sayings, with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell, Translated uh, a translation of the word Gehenna. So it looks like in order to enter into life, which is commonly understood as eternal life, go to heaven when you die, or possibly regeneration, you have to do a work. And that work is a radical discipleship, or commonly called lordship salvation. If you wish to enter life, keep the commandments. Now, this young man sincerely came to the Lord Jesus, the rich young ruler, and he wanted to know how he could enter the kingdom or obtain eternal life or inherit eternal life. And rather than give him the four spiritual laws, Jesus said, keep the commandments. So it appears that in order to enter into life, which is understood again as go to heaven when you die, you've got to do some good works. Now, I'm, of course, very aware of the various interpretations of this. I'm just laying out some of the difficulties here so we can set a context. Well, what is that surpassing righteousness? That's critical. For some, the surpassing righteousness simply refers to the imputed righteousness of Christ the righteousness that Abraham experienced when he believed God and it was reckoned unto him for righteousness. And I can't deny that there's a possibility here. This is a common evangelical workaround for this verse. The problem is, and I think most of the commentaries that I'm aware of concur, is that righteousness in the Sermon on the Mount is not forensic justification. It's not the imputed righteousness of Christ, but it's a way of living. It's a kingdom lifestyle, a way of walking with God as defined in the sermon itself. The other possibility then is it is a walk with God as defined in the sermon. This seems to be evident from a number of considerations. It involves the qualities of poverty of spirit, meekness, mercifulness, and purity of heart. It exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees in six particulars. Murder, adultery, divorce, oaths, retaliation, and loving one's enemies. In other words, when Jesus himself defines it in the following verses... He defines it in terms of ethical character. Later on in the sermon, he will tell us that it manifests itself in trusting our Heavenly Father for our needs and removing our own faults before judging others. It involves obedience to the golden rule. And then he'll describe it as entering the narrow way, which I cannot... uh, understand as John 14:6 because in the context of the sermon the way referred to is a way of life the the way of life that he's just been talking about in the sermon on the mount now a number of scholars just to give me some credibility here Davies and Allison in their excellent commentary Say, the meaning of righteousness in 520 is determined by the paragraphs that follow, the antitheses that I just described. Righteousness is therefore Christian character and conduct, 
in accordance with the demands of Jesus. Right intention, right word, right deed. Hence, righteousness does not refer even implicitly to God's gift. The Pauline forensic eschatological connotation is absent. Balcom makes the comment, entry into the Basileia, the kingdom, is promised as a reward to those who do a better righteousness, to the one who does the will of the Father. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of scholarly reserve. How do evangelicals or other scholars address this? Because even those who do not accept canonical theology, they can see that there is a apparent contradiction between what Jesus is saying here and much of the New Testament, particularly the epistles of Paul and the Gospel of John. So what they do is exercise scholarly reserve. Uh, <clears throat> ethical demands, this is Betts in his excellent commentary on the sermon, ethical demands should shape this way of life. But the purpose of such demands is primarily eschatological in that their goal is to qualify the disciple, to qualify the disciple for entering into the kingdom of heavens. Now the busy pastor using Betts' commentary says, huh? He looks at that and he says, gosh, how, how is he going to explain that? And here's his explanation. In some way, God provides this righteousness through Jesus Christ for those who believe in him. Now, he doesn't tell us what that way is. <clears throat> Another illustration more recently is Don Carson's good commentary. Verse 20 does not establish how the righteousness is to be gained developed or empowered simply lays out the demand <clears throat> now you're getting ready to teach a Sunday school class or a sermon on Sunday morning and you pull out those two commentaries and you're puzzling over what this means and you find out they don't give you an answer this is called scholarly reserve uh, two, <laughs> a, couple, a couple of uh, years ago, I was studying at Tyndale House, and I sat down next to a wonderful guy. He was a professor of New Testament at London Bible College. We had an interesting conversation, and he was <coughs> talking. Uh, t he told me he was developing an exegetical commentary on the book of Acts. <coughs> so I said, well, listen, professor, can I ask you to do me a favor? When you get to Acts chapter 8 and you find out that these people had believed and were baptized, but they had not yet received the gift of the Holy Spirit, I want you to help me out here, because I thought that if you didn't have the Spirit, you weren't a Christian. But here these guys had believed and baptized, and they didn't have the Spirit. Now, you can answer that question for me when you come to Acts chapter 8. And he looked at me kind of blankly, and he said, Well, that's not the purpose of the commentary. The... the, the <laughs> The, uh, the purpose of the commentary is just talk about what Luke said in Acts. In other words, there's this skew, a skewing of any kind of theological uh, analysis or explanation that helps us understand what's going on. Now, this professional caution and unwillingness to be dogmatic win, wins many kudos from the academic guild. But it leaves a pastor without help when he has to teach through some of these difficult passages. Well, how do we harmonize this? How can we harmonize Matthew and Paul? Jesus in Matthew, in the entry saying, seems to say that entering heaven, life, entering the kingdom, is based upon works. And yet, we know from the rest of the New Testament and from the Gospel of John that entering the kingdom is through faith alone. <clears throat> well, as I have looked into how this is handled, I've seen several different ways that surface in the journal articles and the various commentaries addressing this apparent tension. <clears throat> 
The first one we've already talked about, well, yeah, works are a condition for final entrance into heaven. That's what it says. And if we weren't so hung up about the Reformation and Luther and Calvin, we would see this automatically. And we wouldn't always be reading our Reformation theology into the New Testament. Uh, this is not uncommon. There's a second one that is a little bit more common. And this is to simply say, well... I understand that it says you enter the kingdom by the surpassing righteousness of Christ and you have to do the will of the Father and you've got to obey commandments, but faith alone and grace alone is assumed in these passages. Well, of course, that's possible. We know that Jesus believed that, so it's not unreasonable to believe that he was just assuming that his audience knew that. Well, then they start looking for verses in Matthew, in particular, that will substantiate that. And they find, I desire compassion. And they say, well, see, this is grace alone by faith alone. Or others have uh, creatively found faith alone by grace alone uh, in the phrase, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a slave above his master. This, it is argued, is similar to the in Christ uh, expressions in, uh, in Paul. Some creative minds find the gospel in the statement, blessed are the poor in spirit. And of course, Luke 12, 31 has to be quoted, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. The problem is, is this gift comes on the basis of doing acts of charity. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come to you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, for, because, or because you did this. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Like most references to inheriting the kingdom, it's grounded on works, works of charity in this case. <clears throat> but, but last year I was talking with a wonderful woman. She's actually my spiritual mother, led me to Christ 47 years ago. She's 92. I came to Christ through the death of her daughter, Mikey, who was a believer. I was not, but Mikey used to talk to me about Jesus. And after Mikey died, I would go down to mom and papa, and I'd spend one weekend a month when I was a fraternity guy at Oregon State University. We'd stay up till the wee hours of the morning talking about the heathen in Africa, I wish I was as concerned that now as I was then. <laughs> it was a major preoccupation. Uh, or all the contradictions in the Bible or evolution. Dear people, love Jesus, love the Lord. And I was with her last year. And she asked me, Jody, I'm confused about this works business. I said, well, why? She says, well, in Matthew 25, it says they're going to inherit the kingdom on the basis of deeds of charity. It seems to say salvation is grounded in works. Now, I'm sure you've heard people quote this verse. It's a common passage that is brought up. A third possible way is that Jesus is using the law to convict of sin. You know, the New Testament says, through the law comes a knowledge of sin. So what's really happening here is that the Pharisees wanted to know how to enter the kingdom. And they were assuming that you had to be good enough. So Jesus says, okay, given your premises, here's how good you have to be. Uh, I first picked this up from my friend Hal Lindsey. I remember when we were on crusade staff, uh, Linda and I joined staff back in, uh, what, 64? Dating myself here, I'm 67 now. And uh, <coughs> not when I was 64, but in 1964. And... Uh, I remember how I was a brand new believer, just trusted Jesus, and he, he went through the Sermon on the Mount and used the whole thing as a, 
uh, example of how Jesus used the law to convict non-believers of sin. Of course, the problem is, is that the sermon was directed to his disciples. <laughs> it says in the opening verses that he went up a little way on the hill and his disciples came to him and speaking to them, he said. So all of these passages we're talking about were addressed to believing people. <clears throat> Salvation is always evidenced by works. Now, this is a standard uh, reform perspective. And coming from their frame of reference, uh, namely that works are always the inevitable and necessary fruit of saving faith, uh, there's a certain plausibility to this. Uh, <clears throat> a good example is Craig Blomberg. The greater righteousness Christ demands is not an entrance requirement but a lifestyle characteristic that God enables those who come to him in Christ increasingly to approximate. Well, one wonders how much of a lifestyle is necessary. That would be the first difficulty with that. Um, what is it uh, that we would have to be to approximate the lifestyle that would define us as a truly saved person? But the essential explanation here is that these passages about works are not conditions of entrance, but they are characteristics of those who do. Pretty clever. And uh, I don't think a Galilean fisherman would say anything but, huh? Uh, I can't imagine that kind of uh, post-Reformation polemics being read back into the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it, it, well, anyway, I, plus, it just, it, on the surface, most people, unless they have a theological axe to grind, usually acknowledge that Jesus is, t particularly the liberals, I should say, just say, well, Jesus is teaching salvation by works. You guys are too preoccupied with Luther. And Calvin. There's a more recent angle. Getting saved is by faith. Staying saved, unless I shouldn't say that's more recent, is by works. Now this view, frankly, is a lot more believable to me. This is the classic Arminian view, more recently dressed up by E.P. Sanders in the new perspective that you get in the covenant by faith and you stay in it by works. To quote one well-known uh, Arminian theologian, John Miley. He says, it seems clearly the sense of scripture that future blessedness is a conditional attainment. He that endureth to the end shall be saved unto them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality shall be rendered eternal life. And then the final solution that is becoming very in vogue in evangelical circles today, I call neo-nomianism. It's the new legalism. It's followed by quite a few prominent evangelical scholars now. I've been surprised at how this is sweeping into so many niches and corners of evangelicalism. But essentially the idea is that justification is not an event, but a process. Uh, <clears throat> and to enter the kingdom is final soteriological salvation, but is achieved by means of perseverance. Ellen Stanley, uh, a fine man. I, I have interacted with Alan by email, really like him. He's got a good heart for the Lord. But he wrote a book called Did Jesus Teach Salvation According to Works? And his answer is yes. And he says it this way. Somewhere along the way, converted sinners become righteous and therefore eligible to enter the kingdom. 
Now, although the phraseology is different, this concept could be directly lifted from the Council of Trent. The documents of Trent go like this. Faith cooperating with good works increase in that justice, that is, uh, believers become more righteous in daily life, which they have received through the grace of Christ and are still further justified. In other words, as you progress through life, you become more and more righteous, and eventually you are righteous enough to uh, enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, of course, a major difficulty with this view is that, according to the New Testament, justification is an event, not a process. Uh, He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And at the point in time, I believed... I was made eligible, according to the New Testament. Therefore, having been justified by faith, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. According to the New Testament, I've already been justified, and I already have peace with God, and I already stand acceptance. There's no more improvement in my quality of life that could render me more righteous and hence more acceptable. So those are the solutions that I'm aware of. In summary, works are a condition for obtaining final entrance to heaven, is the standard solution given by the liberals. Salvation by faith alone is merely assumed. That's not impossible, but uh, you never see any references to it in the passages in question. Uh, The straightforward reading of these passages has led most to believe that Jesus is teaching salvation by works, a problem which evangelicals try to address by various workarounds, and liberals just say, see, that's what it says. (coughs) Jesus is using the law to convict is another standard one. I myself used to believe that. Uh, I always followed my mentor, Hal Lindsey, and... uh, In fact, I've used that one a lot with non-Christians when they, and I still do. In fact, I think it's a legitimate use of the sermon. Every once in a while on an airplane or something, I get into a discussion and I'll I'll run into somebody who thinks he's going to heaven on the basis of good works or he'll tell me, you know, my religion is just the Sermon on the Mount. I'm sure you've heard of this. I say, oh, really? That's that's wonderful. Uh, Let's let's look at it. (laughs) And... uh, I remember I was talking with a, uh, a guy that was a, a pilot in World War II, and he'd taken off from his aircraft carrier in the Pacific, and he came back, and his landing field was gone. The carrier had been sunk. <laughs> so he's circling out here in the middle of the Pacific, and he finally has to go into the drink. And he, survived, he, he survives. He, he, he gets in there. He says, God, if you'll save me. Uh, I'll serve you the rest of my life. You Kind of the foxhole atheist thing that you often hear about. Well, there it was, sitting next to me in the airplane. Really nice guy. And he was your standard Catholic, good works, loving father, husband. I talked to him for quite a bit, and I said, well, how good do you think you'd have to be to get into the kingdom of heaven, Bill? Because he'd been describing all these good works. And I remember he said, well, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well... How good? And he said, well, I think you'd have to get a 94. (laughs) So so I said, well, let's look at how good Jesus said you had to be. So I I took him to, uh, if you've ever been angry with another person, you've already committed murder in your heart and you're not, you're already under judgment. I said, Bill, have you ever been angry? Well, yeah. Well, according to this, uh, you're not good enough and you won't enter the kingdom. Oh, can't mean that. So I go to the next verse. If you've ever looked on a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And uh, you're under judgment. I said, how about you, Bill? Have you ever looked on a woman with lust in your heart? He said, well, yeah. I said, well, then, Bill, you're not good enough. You're already under judgment. Can't mean that. So then I went to Matthew 5.48. 
Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. How about you, Bill? Are you as perfect as God is? Wow, oh, can't mean that. <laughs> and, of course, I don't think it does, but I was using the sermon that way. And, and uh, uh, But it gave me an opportunity to go to 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, as perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. Anyway, I used to use that as a springboard into the gospel. But that was wrong. (laughs) The other one we talked about, salvation is always evidenced by works. There's good discussion of this in John Nolan. Uh, recent uh, Greek commentary. Uh, he kind of ties himself up. I was going to quote that, but it would get too involved. Uh, he's a professor of New Testament at uh, what Trinity College at Bristol. Getting saved is by faith, but staying saved is by works. This is the standard Arminian response. And ethical righteousness is the means God uses to bring us to heaven. Okay, this is found... For example, in Douglas Moo's commentary on Romans, uh, he does, he's not as uh, blatant as this, but it's very pronounced in Thomas Schreiner's uh, commentary, which is a good commentary uh, on the book of Romans. Uh, Schreiner and Ardell, I think it's pronounced Cain Day or Canada, I'm not sure, uh, they wrote a book called The Race Set Before Us, in which they expound this viewpoint in great detail. Uh, Schreiner is the next speaker at the, uh, the uh, JETS, uh, the Evangelical Theological Society Conference. And I remember I, I wrote them, and I asked, you know, this is an evangelical society, and whatever evangelical means, it used to mean by salvation is by faith alone, through grace alone. And uh, didn't get a response. But, well, actually, I did, a very nice response. But, uh, so, the, the point is, is that this problem is real. It's being discussed in a lot of the literature. Uh, you'll find scores, perhaps hundreds of articles on harmony between Jesus and Paul in the scholarly literature. There's a number of books that have been written just addressing this problem and how do you harmonize them. And... Uh, In the next message, I'm going to attempt to do that. But let's pause for prayer, and we'll take a break. (laughs) Father, we want to know uh, what your word says. And I, I pray that you would keep me from saying anything that is not pleasing to you or is contrary uh, to the scriptures. Grant us that illumination that you promised. I pray that for some there might be that aha moment that happened to me several years ago. In Jesus' name, amen.